Baku. Welcome to the Baku podcast. Today I'm very excited to be sitting down with Simon Dunn, or Simo, as he's known around these parts. Simo, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks, Mark. How are you doing? Very well, thanks. Uh, we've actually been hanging out most of the morning. Yeah, we certainly have. Been out having a surf at Bells while I uh, um, watched. <laughs> Unfortunately, I couldn't join you this morning because my shoulder's still a little bit busted. Uh, you didn't didn't miss out on much though. Yeah. Nah. But you've been surfing a bit at the moment. You see, you've had a good yeah. run. Yeah, yeah. Been getting out in the water as much as I can, which has been good. I mean, we've had yeah, we've had such a good run of surf this year. So it's been yeah, it's been pretty fun. Mm, lovely. And what are you riding at the moment? Oh, mainly just my longboard. Yeah. Uh-huh. So just been jumping on that past few months and yeah. I do like to just ride different boards and whatnot, uh, like mid lengths and twenties and whatnot. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you, I've seen the collection in the garage. <laughs> it's become a bit of a thing over the last few years. Yeah. Um, when did you start surfing? Is that something you've been doing your whole life, or is that more um, recent? Uh, I mean, growing up, we'd go down to the beach during summer and sort of spend a bit of time in the water, but. Yeah, I have. I kind of got got into it a bit more in my late teens. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because my dad surfs, so yeah, he was able to show me the ropes. And yeah, ever since I got my license, I've been pretty hooked on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in Australia, having a license is kind of essential for surfing. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> Even when you live at the beach. For sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember like when we try and get the bus. It would be a full day mission just to get one surf in, mm. whereas now it's like you can just kind of go whenever. So, pretty grateful for that. Excellent. So at the moment you're living, um, you're living in Jan Jack. Yeah. Pretty cool old house that you're renting um, with a few housemates. Yeah. But did you grow up in on the coast or were you just up the road? No. Nah, so I yeah I grew up in Geelong, so in a suburb called Grovedale. Um, yeah, which isn't too far from from the coastline um yeah and then sort of when i was 19 moved out of home to juck and haven't looked back since (laughs) (laughs) the surfing lifestyle yeah no it's yeah a pretty simplistic lifestyle but pretty content with it at the moment so Mm. and 19 so how many years is that now i'd be like four years four years now yeah four years on the coast yeah yeah, surfing and doing a bit of retail. Yeah, just working a bit of retail and, yeah, surfing, skating and hanging out with friends. It's, yeah, it's pretty good. Keeping it simple. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. So, um, your first love wasn't surfing. Your first love was uh, was actually skateboarding, which makes a lot of sense being up the road in Geelong. Tell us a bit about how did you discover skateboarding? Yeah, so... I reckon I was around four, the age of four or five, and I used to get on my dad's PlayStation 1 console. Yes. And he had a few games. I remember mainly playing, there was a Wu-Tang Shaolin game, which was almost like a Tekken game, which was pretty pretty gnarly being exposed to that at a young age, yes. <laughs> listening to all the Wu-Tang albums. Um, and then there was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. And yeah, I played that through my youth and yeah, I was hooked on it. Mm. Just loved everything about it. Sort of got to got to know all the, the tricks before I started skating and the soundtrack of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty core. Cool. <laughs> so you're playing that at four, four or five years old <laughs> yeah. on yeah. the PlayStation 1. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. And Tony Hawk, that was a great game. That was, kind of, oh, it's unreal. That was a staple yeah. The PlayStation 1. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Many late nights playing that. <laughs> nah, my parents are pretty strict on 6 o'clock shut off and yep. throw on the SBS news. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah, so then... And then um, growing up, we... On the weekends, we'd always go fishing down in Geelong at the Cunningham Pier. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I, I'd... I would see people skating out the front of Deakin Uni, just skating street. And I was like, what is this? Like just being so like amazed at 
what they were doing and just really curious. And then when they built that plaza park so at the, the waterfront, the waterfront there, yeah, yeah, I started going there and just watching everyone skating and just like, yeah, with just like a fresh set of eyes going, man, like this is so cool. Just everything about it, just watching yeah, everyone's skating and going, oh, like that person's got scratch marks on his board. Like he must skate. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then it's actually pretty funny. Like I used to ride scooters like a lot of a lot of young kids did because it's so easy to ride. And I remember buying uh, a set of scooter bars on eBay and they were like a dollar because I'd won this like bid. And I got them and then like the day I got them, I was out the front of my house and I did like a little like bunny hop and the bar snapped oh. and I was like, oh no, this, this is not great. So then I just picked up an old skateboard that I had in the shed and that, that was me occupied for the time being. And then I had a friend that was, that was down the road that also skated and yeah, and that's kind of where it where it took off. Just became obsessed with it from day dot. So if it hadn't been for those dodgy eBay scooter bars, <laughs> we might never have had Simon on a skateboard. <laughs> yeah, still yeah, be perhaps scooting around. Yeah, I don't know how people would think of that, but <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much how I kind of got into it. Mm. Um, I think everyone who skates can remember the first time they saw people really skateboarding. Totally. Um, and there is something intriguing about it. And often it's, I can remember, like I was at the Glen Shopping Centre, same sort of deal, and I was only five or six, but seeing these guys who would have been mid-teens and just, like, not doing anything spectacular, but skating well enough and doing some kick flips and, and clearing some little gaps and things and just thinking, this is, this is, a, how, where do I get one of these? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? um, and that was right around the time double kicks had just been invented. Mm. You know, so, um, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't uh, as accessible as I think. Probably by the time you were growing up, totally. skateboarding was becoming more mainstream. There were more skate parks popping up. Mm, totally. Uh, the plaza in Geelong. What other parks did you have in Geelong at the time? Um, well, there's a few kicking around. Like there's one in Cario, Cario Bowls, which was... Built in the seventies, I believe. Yeah, that's pretty ancient, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's got a lot of yeah history there. And there was warm ponds that was built around. I think it was like late nineties, early, real early two thousands. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I remember going there as a kid when we just watched all the people skating there. And same thing, I was just like so amazed at everything about it, and yeah, the, how people interacted as well. I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. What was the scene like when you first hopped on a skateboard and you started hitting Warm Pond Skate Park? And yeah, it's pretty um pretty gnarly, like a bit rough around the edges. Growing up there, you'd see a lot lot of action, just a lot of troubled youth that had to expend energy somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, a lot of the people there they were all riding BMX, so and like at a really high level at such a young age and. There was a big group of BMX riders that used to go there, and I think I was like sometimes like the only skater that would that would rock up, um, and I'd always have to just wait my turn and do my time there and sort of earn, earn a bit of respect from the crew because yeah, you just sort of had to always kind of be on your toes because you wouldn't know what would what would happen. <laughs> yeah, and and the, like there's a there is a period of just absorbing the way the skate park works. Totally. What, where people's lines will take them. Yeah. And um, just learning the etiquette of the skate park and, yeah, just keeping yourself safe as well. Like, it's mm. pretty important. And, yeah. Did you, get, did you ever get in any trouble as a kid around the skate parks in terms of guys going after you? And Totally, yeah. yeah. There's been many times where we've had to be cautious. Um, yeah, just, I guess, there was this one time where this car full of it was like a brand new car probably was stolen and it rolled up and you kind of have a feeling like when when something happens you kind of like you can brush it off but then there's times where you're you're much more like vigilant your spidey senses are like yeah something's not quite (laughs) right here totally yeah and um yeah there was there was some stuff that 
went down like people trying to jump kids and it's like that's the last place you'd want to jump people because kids don't have money at the skate park that's right. <laughs> it's just an easy target yeah, yeah there was one my yeah there was a time where i was skating just down the ledge and when you're skating you're so invested in in that moment where you're just sort of not really thinking about any external factors that come mm. in and there was this guy he was sort of he looked very on it on edge and he was pacing up and down and this is when i first yeah was sort of going to the skate park um on my own and yeah he like ran for my belongings and just darted off and i i fully just went into fight response and just chased after him i was like (laughs) put the phone down like he grabbed my phone and he had my keys but he luckily dropped the keys mm. um which was good and he had my phone and i was like drop the phone drop the phone and he fully like pulled out pulls out a knife on me like and i was like whoa so whoa. i kind of just backed off and let him take the phone it was a pretty pretty crappy phone anyway it didn't didn't really mean too much but <laughs> that was a bit rattling the how, time. how old do you reckon you were? I was pretty young. I reckon I was. I reckon I would, it would have been when I just got my license. I reckon. Okay. Yeah. It's around eighteen. Yeah, but other than that, like, dodge, dodged a few encounters, which is good. You just got to be, I guess, teaches you how to be street smart in a sense. <laughs> mm. And that's when skate parks were still kind of off the grid a little bit. You totally. Know? Um, they were almost like I think when I was younger. There was the bowl out in Knox, which was kind of... He had to drive down a dirt road behind the... Mm-hmm. Way behind the shopping centre at the back of nowhere to skate something. Yeah. Uh, Karaya, Karaya Bowls was probably kind of similar. Totally. In that regard, they put them out of sight, out of mind. Um, but that's changed a heap now. And For even sure. New Ponds Park, you know, it's got... It's like a basketball court and a, a bit of a soccer goal or something <laughs> yeah. integrated into it to try yeah. and encourage you know, barbecues and... Totally, and just kind of promoting safer spaces for people to partake in, mm. which is important, but yeah. And it, and there's a tension there because it's almost like, and I think with all these things, the pendulum swings, mm-hmm. you know, it was from like just out of sight, out of mind, let them go and smoke bongs out there somewhere <laughs> where we don't have to look at it, yeah. um, right through to now, let's put a kid's playground in the middle of the skate park. And almost not thinking too much about how that will impact on the users, both the kids in the park and the and the guys who are really there to skate, yeah, properly. Mm. You know, who are going fast, who are who are throwing themselves at obstacles and tricks, and and then trying to avoid the mini kids <laughs> <laughs> yeah. chasing their soccer balls into the bowl. You yeah, know? Um, so it's almost like we're trying to find this balance where it is a safe space, but safe in for everyone in, in involved all the different yeah everyone involved so yeah. the kids can play uh there are eyes on the skate park yeah parents around but also still encourage people to to skate hard and have a good time yeah totally because there is that sort of notion of skate parks being intimidating so i guess nowadays it's sort of sort of pushing in that direction to be more inclusive which i think is is healthy mm. yeah definitely um, and it's kind of a parallel to surfing. You said when you first started turning up to the skate park and when it was a bit rougher, um, and you really had to earn your spot in the lineup effectively, <laughs> yeah. you know, and the same thing happened here when I started surfing, I just started paddling out at bells and I reckon I paddled out a dozen times before anyone let me have a wave. You know, it was the, oh, this guy keeps showing up. He's having a bit of a chat. All right. You get this wave now. Yeah, you know? Totally. And there was a bit of a, like a hierarchy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't think we want to lose all of that mm. because there is something about being respectful and appreciating the other people who have been doing it longer than you, who know the spot better than you, um, and doing some time to just observe and then to actually take on the tips once you become invited into that group. Mm. Um, but now, you know, and you're skating a lot more than I am now, <laughs> but um, what, what's it like? What, how would you describe that shift? Is there still a respect for the dudes who are, who are more established and ripping? 
in terms of skateboarding in terms of the skate scene yeah. yeah i mean i guess when you are young you do look up to to certain skateboarders in terms of like their style and you know their i guess their way of their approach to skateboarding so i think too like yeah you can learn a lot from the older guys because they've been in it f- for a long time so yeah i think um there is that aspect of yeah respecting your elders and learning through their what they've experienced in their time yeah mm. did you have any major influences on your skateboarding when you were yeah sort of growing up yeah for sure like skateboarding sort of takes you through a journey where you you meet a lot of people as soon as you see someone else with a board it's like yeah like you resonate with them because you you you've got a similar interest and you start looking at people's shoes to see if the toes are worn (laughs) yeah yeah fully you can you can really dictate what stance they are by you know the holes on their shoes (laughs) oh well they're in skate shoes but they don't look like they skate yeah or they're just like mall grabbing around the shopping center yeah oh questionable (laughs) no each to their own shoes yeah (laughs) but yeah um yeah so your major influx like, was there any characters around Geelong who, yeah. who like took you under their wing and yeah totally helped you so along? um when it was around 2013 the the park the indoor skate park unfortunately recently just just closed after ten years um, that opened up and that that opened up a lot of I guess opportunities to meet new people and skate with a larger community. Um, they used to run Thursday night skates there where, yeah, everyone would just be there. People from Melbourne, people from country towns, all the suburbs, like just meet there and skate. And whether it was street, park, mini ramp. And the vert. vert. <laughs> the enormous vert ramp. Yeah. So there was people there that we sort of, yeah, a group of us, we'd get into vert skating and guys like Trevor Ward, Jimmy LaRocco, they, they sort of built that ramp, Flaz, um, and they really like nurtured us as young kids and helped us just build confidence in, yeah, skating vert because it's quite an intimidating thing when you first get into it. But yeah, they really um, helped us and showed us the ropes. Yeah, which is really good at a young age. That's a pretty solid crew to have around when you're learning to skate a vert ramp. For sure, just like pushing you, um, yeah, to just learn new tricks at a faster rate and and have fun and just challenge yourself yeah and so that was just pretty much your thursday night skate night yeah like i had a membership so i'd go probably two three times a week i'd get like two buses from where i used to live and um yeah go there after school and on the weekends and yeah just there'd be like a group of us and we'd we'd always be seshing the vert ramp so even from Warren Ponds to North Geelong there, a couple of buses, that's like an hour, right? Yeah, fully. Just to get to the skate park? Yeah, if not longer sometimes when you're waiting for different bus bus times table, the timetables and whatnot. Um, but you, totally worth it. And three times a week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So right about that. Definitely loving it. Yeah. Um, what did you do in the transit time? Um, like how, how did you spend that transit time? Because that's a lot of time. Uh, I reckon just listening to music get mm-hmm. just getting psyched for your session <laughs> and just conserving as much energy as possible you could yeah like i probably would just yeah just observe what's going on and just yeah sort of get into a, a good mood to just go and skate because you knew you were in for a good time mm. so the anticipation and just keeping yourself at that yeah keep vibing for sure get ready for the session yeah uh, and when it came to learning new tricks i mean because vert ramps are intimidating. I think that's probably the most intimidating thing to watch for normal people. And people who don't skate in particular, it's impressive because it's big. You know, mm-hmm. And guys are flying out of the ramp into the air. Uh, as you were learning to, to ride a vert ramp and developing those skills, what, what did you go through? Like, What was the learning process from... Because you probably dropped into some mini ramps and stuff before. But then taking that to the to the vert ramp, what what ha- what was that like? Yeah, um, it's definitely getting used to more transition takes a bit of time. But then 
after consistently skating, you sort of learn that the transition can help you at times where you are trying a trick. You have more time to sort of, if you need to bail, you've got more time, you've got more transition. You're not going to land right on the flat bottom. So I feel like if you had the confidence, learning tricks on the vert ramp isn't as hard and complex. Um, But I guess for me anyway, processing it was like, having to conquer it on smaller transition first before I'd even think about doing it on vert. But then there's other guys like that could do tricks on vert and can't do it on mini ramp or could mm. barely do a kick flip, but then they're boosting like judo airs on the vert. It's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. It's just, I guess it just comes down to each individual and their, their way of learning. Um, but when you, when you did learn a new trick on the vert ramp, it was the best feeling ever. <laughs> what was it? What was the trick that stuck? when you were like in terms of vert skating, what was the one trick that that was that was tough to make and then once you had it, that was like the pinnacle? Oh, I wasn't doing anything too sophisticated on the vert ramp. Just kind of a few lip tricks, a few airs and I was pretty, pretty happy with that. But yeah, I don't know. There's n- never really a trick that would stand out, but it was more just making run, like a run and yeah. just hitting a few walls and popping up on the platform and not having to walk up the stairs constantly. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of my goal. Yeah, if you can pop out, then that's a solid Yeah, run. Yeah, yeah, if you can leave the session like with no broken bones, like you're sweet. <laughs> and was that like a, a period of your life where, I mean, while you were at the park and, and ran that crew, where you were skating a bit more of that big transition stuff? Yeah, totally. Like having access to a, a vert ramp that was 90 foot wide, it's like pretty amazing and not not – an opportunity that many skaters would would have so yeah having that was was great and like all of us would just push each other to like skate and yeah it was a really good dynamic at the time mm. yeah and around that time were you doing comps because you, you did the geelong comps for yeah. quite a while when you were younger yeah uh tell us a little bit about those competitions what yeah was like? those comps were really fun so i guess a lot of them were ran through YMCA mm-hmm. um, and they ran them across Victoria. So that was really good to be able to like every weekend go and go to a new skate park, meet new people. And it was normally like the same crew that we would go together with. So yeah, that was really fun because it's sort of, yeah, it's sort of just good to kind of progress with everyone in a mm. sense and just enjoy each other's time um that was really good i really enjoyed doing that yeah and how frequent were the comps when they were in full swing yeah i mean it sort of depended like most of the time they would have them like once a fortnight depending on the weather as well like that was the worst when you'd be checking the bomb radar constantly going is it gonna rain is it should we go like but yeah normally they'd they'd run they used to run the Northwestern series, which was around winter time, and then they'd run like a summer one. Um, but the local comps were good because you didn't have to commute as far. Yeah. Yeah. And look, Victoria, it's always a game of the weather for skateboarding. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> it's, uh, hit and miss. Um, do you see skateboarding as something, because it's a bit like surfing too in some ways, in that you've got the hardcore competitors and then you've got the guys who turn it into more of an art. And then there's some guys who cross over. Mm. Where, do, where do you see skateboarding in terms of the relationship with competitions? I mean, I feel like skating, because it's something that you can just truly express in your own way through your approach, your style, your trick selection. Like that's always going to be embedded in skateboarding. And I feel like there's people with different motivations, whether that's the external motivation of winning comps earning money earning a living off it and then there's crew that yeah simply do it for the love and joy of skateboarding where it's more purely just for yeah hanging out with your mates and doing something to yeah clear your mind and get away from the daily norms Mm. yeah i think the competition does push people to progress as like you said with your group of mates at that time um going to comps together and everyone pushing mm. themselves. Competition has a place in terms of helping people to, to really 
get focused and for sure and learn the next trick for sure yeah yeah there's 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 definitely a really good incentive to sort of push yourself and push your abilities and sort of progress to the next level with competitions um, but then there's also that side of it too that can sometimes take the fun out of it because you're putting way too much pressure on yourself to compete but at the end of the day it's like you've spent a day at the skate park with all your mates and you've had fun so that's all that really matters and keeping it fun for kids in particular i think is super important for sure um so in terms of skating now you're still getting on the board quite a bit um and what's skateboarding about for for you now i mean for me now it's sort of because i'm into other outlets as well it's sort of something that I can just do purely for fun and enjoyment and have no pressure to do anything. But, I mean, it'd be nice to learn a new trick. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I feel like being conscious of as you get older, you sort of don't want to really get hurt because you've got other responsibilities to tend to and whatnot. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. Like, sort of, I feel like for, for me now is sort of, paving the way for the younger generation to go and pursue it and get the most out of it because it's definitely given me so much so it's like i feel like for me it's really um, it's time for me to sort of nurture that space for other people and just guide them through through the journey in whatever way that means paying it forward yeah yeah and that's kind of where we connected wasn't it in terms of uh, for sure doing a couple of skate coaching lessons together with the ymca yeah as part of a covid recovery program (laughs) which everybody wanted to skateboard during covid that was pretty funny oh man it went off like skateboarding boomed i don't know if it was like a tiktok trend or something rather but yeah like everyone wanted to get into it and it was good to see you know all the kids and the dads yeah (laughs) and the mums like the amount (laughs) of mini ramps that would have got built around the area would have been yeah pretty good but yeah, I mean, that was a really good time for people to just try something new. They had the time to do it. So it was like, yeah, pick up a new skill. And for some people, it was skating. And for, for others, it might have been golf. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whatever floats your boat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and that was fun. Like doing the coaching and having that formalized now. Because mm. um, did, you, did you get any coaching as a kid? Because you're... Nah, it was purely just almost like self-learn or learning off others. Or you'd you'd watch like a skate video on YouTube or watch a video part and just sort of analyze it through that way. Mm. So, yeah, there wasn't really a lot of guidance through it all. Like from my experience anyway, you sort of just go to the skate park and figure it out on your own. And when you did, it was a good feeling. But when you didn't, it was like, oh, where do I I even start? Where do you start? Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I reckon like because... Particularly some old crew think skateboard coaching, oh, it doesn't, we don't need that. Like, that's not skateboarding. Yeah. Uh, but I, I kind of think about it in terms of, you know, you think about, say, an instrument like a classical instrument, like sure. piano or violin. Right. There's a super established framework for getting good. Mm-hmm. So when somebody wants to learn that instrument, you go to a teacher who can teach you the fundamentals and who can structure your learning in such a way that you will progress if you keep coming back if you keep doing your practice you will progress and because skateboarding is only a relatively new sport i mean we're talking guys like rodney mullen inventing the kickflip in like the 70s and 80s yeah it's only what what's that like 40 50 years old as a sport and to the point where our equipment now is actually useful compared to what they started with i think we're only just hitting that point where it can be broken down into a systematic approach to learning and certainly for somebody new who's hopping on a board for the first time you can take out a whole lot of those obstacles when i mean what we, we were just teaching people basically how to stand yeah, on a board you know? fully just the basics to get them rolling and giving them the confidence to be able to just push down the street and hang out with their mates that's it to get them started get yeah. them going get them into the, and, and by the end of that time most of those kids were better than me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like dropping in yeah. and, and doing all sorts of stuff. Um, but certainly, I think that coaching element has a place now. Um, where do you see it going in the future in terms of like 
kids getting into skateboarding, it's quite different to try not to get beat up at the skate park and <laughs> yeah. looking after your stuff to be able to go down, yeah, actually book some time with with somebody who can actually coach you through for those sure. early stages. Yeah, for sure. I think it definitely has a place with skateboarding. Um, just purely for, yeah, creating a space where kids can feel welcomed, supported, and just to purely enjoy being there and having like facilitating a space where you're guided and supported through it is definitely going to, yeah, be beneficial in terms of how you're, how you're going to, because skating's hard. Yes. It's not an easy thing to get into. I mean, for some, it's like people are just gifted and they've got the natural ability to do it. But yeah, like trying to start somewhere, it, it can be hard to get off the ground. And that's what, like growing up, I remember heaps of kids go, I used to skate. I quit skating. Kids yeah, and then I grew like, up. <laughs> yeah, kids would last like three months and they go, ah, oh, no, I'm not skateboarding anymore. Yeah. And basically what they were really saying was, I'm stuck. I don't know how to progress. Mm-hmm. I don't know where to get any support. So I'll give it away. Yeah. I'll go do something else. Yeah. And like, I guess too, like if you get rattled by an injury, it's sort of, it's very off-putting to try and get back on the board. So. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> what about learning how to fall? Did you, did do you, I mean, because you skate without any padding most of the time. Um, how do you, how do you, how'd you learn how to bail well? Yeah, I mean, like especially like skating transition, you sort of can learn how to bail by feeling. So like if you're trying a certain trick and you're not locking into it right, you can sort of at the moment know that that has occurred and sort of, learn how to bail safely but then there's other times where you're like fully committing to the trick and you just cop a huge slam <laughs> that's inevitable like <laughs> it's part of the skateboard. but yeah there is aspects where you you can learn how to bail um i guess that just takes time and takes a few slams to figure out um, but once you do learn how to bail then that gives you sort of more leeway in progressing mm. Yeah, so you're not just constantly beating yourself up on the concrete. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is probably the least fun aspect <laughs> yeah. of skateboarding in general. Um, but skateboarding for you as well, you found another expression. You've you spent a lot of time in retail over the last few years up at Blunt Skateboard Shop here in Torquay and hooked up pretty much everyone here with the new setups. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you found a new expression for that in Sabi Skateboards as yeah. well. Yeah, totally. So... um. Yeah, I mean, working at Blunt was really good. Like Mike, the owner, he sort of was looking after me at a young age with boards and yeah, he's really good in that regard with youth and sort of encouraging them to skate and surf and yeah, that was really, I was really grateful for that experience and then yeah, learning about sort of the skate industry and learning all those fundamentals behind that, that definitely um, inspired me to see yeah, different sort of creative side to skateboarding in a sense where I can I can creatively express myself in other ways through a passion project like starting a skate brand. Yeah, so tell us tell us a little bit about starting Sabi Skateboards because I think that was kind of when we were hanging out and yeah. you, you got some sprint, uh, screen printing gear yeah. on the floor in your bedroom. Yeah. What happened? Yeah, I don't know. I kind of just... I had the role of being the skate hard goods buyer and I really enjoyed that, seeing all the lookbooks and seeing what the new graphics were coming through for the next year and I really admired that sort of aspect of the skate industry. And, yeah, I simply, I don't know, I just went for a run one day and just thought, why don't I just give this a go and learn? Like, essentially, like I wanted to learn how to screen print, so I was like, maybe I can, like, just sell a few teas to my mates like and yeah ride my own boards and that's kind of where it all started like essentially i wanted to start just like a kids kids label where there was like a bit of a gap in the market with kids clothing um but then like it made more sense to sort of just do like a unisex range because all my friends were hitting me up going oh like can i just grab a tea or, or a hat or a hoodie so i was like yeah all right, i guess like <laughs> so you had to expand your range of sizes yeah for sure and like yeah sabi sort of i mean the name of it's derived from a japanese philosophical concept 
on Wabi Sabi. I think people listening may have may have heard it before. But essentially what it is is seeing the nature of reality for what it is and seeing beauty within the imperfections and peacefully accepting the natural cycle of growth, decay, deterioration, aging. Um, yeah, and I just thought that name, yeah, will suit suit the brand. Mm. And stemming from that, you saw a gap in the market because a lot of the brands you were seeing, a lot of the graphics were kind of maybe not congruent with your personal values. Totally, yeah, for sure. Like for me, like I see skating, like obviously it, it's come from, you know, a countercultural background where, you know, you're a misfit, you were maybe a juvenile delinquent making, you know, noise in public. But whereas now I, I see it as something that is user-friendly if if you're in the right space and yeah it's sort of just aligning those because skating is it is an intimidating thing like when you see it at first glance but when you step into it and realize like the community and all all the aspects that are combined with skateboarding you, you then realize hang on like this is actually a really healthy outlet to partake in so and that's what i found and i just want to continue to promote that mm. yeah and finding the beauty in what is. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> finding the beauty in what is. I think that, yeah, and, you know, it, skateboarding was very, you know, and particularly like when I was young in the 90s, it was very much drugs, sex and rock and roll. Yeah. That was the skate Hardcore. Scene. Hardcore. Like yeah. Guys just coming into money pretty quick and traveling the world just going crazy. Yeah. Having a, having a good time. Yeah. Which actually, like the tables are kind of turned. Now the counterculture. Yeah. Yeah is the health oriented and recognizing some benefits, you know, socially, mentally, physically in, in, in outlets like skateboarding. Uh, and I mean, we, we sort of connected around the meditation and philosophical side of things in the last year or two as well. Where do you see, cause you've had a meditation practice now for a few years. Yeah. What sort of parallels can you feel and can you draw between skateboarding and like a seated meditation practice Mm. i feel like you know the concept of mindfulness practice can be applied to anything in in daily life and i guess people talk about like the state of flow and finding your groove and i feel like you find that with different outlets that you do whether it's through music or sport or art I feel like those things are all interconnected in some way and I guess that sort of practice can really be helpful in how you approach and show up through whatever you what it whatever it is that you're passionate about so I feel like that has helped a lot and it it does help um cuz yeah when you do a, do the work and apply it you see the results mm. yeah but yeah I definitely think that it has has deserves a place just it's from within so you just got to tap into it i guess just got to tap in. yeah it's it can be hard <laughs> yeah um and certainly watching you skate um you can see that when you're on it's coming from within like it's it's almost that um there's the intellect is quiet and something else takes over yeah i yeah for sure like I feel like anything you do, whether it's like surfing or skating, it, it does bring you back to the present moment and it, and unintentionally because if you're not, then that's when things can go south. Mm. So, And it's just such a great feeling to be able to be in that space where you're not thinking about the time or you may have been thinking of something prior to this, but now you're, you, you feel like you've released it in such a, you know, a nice, easing way, so... Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> and it's good for you, yeah. It's good for your health. Um, so you also, you've designed the graphics for Sabi Skateboards. Did you have a background in art? No, nah, not at all. Like, I mean, I did obviously like a little bit of art at school and whatnot, but yeah, I sort of just kind of freestyle it a little bit. Like I'm definitely um, curious and intrigued with graphic design and, yeah, that definitely interests me. So, 
yeah, for now it's sort of like it'd be good to probably do a course in it, but for now it's sort of just freestyling and yeah, like if I like something that I like, I'll try and draw inspiration off that and yeah, you can, you can draw inspiration from anywhere really. Like I mean, where where we're situated here, it's like you know, you've got nature and there's such a really good uh c- creative hub around here too. Like there's a lot of creatives and that's very inspiring to be around and yeah, it's good energy. Mm. And skateboarding's always had that element of untrained artists too, I think. Totally. You know, guys like Mark Gonzalez, you know, and Ed Templeton, these guys that I sort of grew up watching Idolizing. their work. In. Yeah, because they were the ones making the boards at the time um, and printing their graphics. And there was kind of this, we'll just do it our way, you know, it was, and it was kind of free. Like we didn't need a degree in art. You just, you just did it. And those guys just having the confidence to put their work out. Mm. And similar to your Sabi skateboards, it's like, I like it. I'm going to put it on a board and see if anyone else likes it. Totally. And it's like, it stems from that with skateboarding where it's the freedom of creative self-expression. You can do it. No one's telling you like how to do it. Like people can guide you through it, but it's like, you can do it however you like, which, which is pretty freeing that element of style which is skateboarding and surfing like we don't look at tennis players very often and go oh i like their style like <laughs> or maybe some people do i don't know but it's, it's not not in the same way that you can admire athleticism in other sports quite often like football or, or tennis or, or more conventional sports mm-hmm. but when you watch somebody on a board whether it's skateboard or snowboard or a surfboard <laughs> style becomes really important you know it's not just about execution to achieve a goal it's actually winning a match yeah it's aesthetically becoming beautiful it's it's beautiful yeah sure and our different bodies and different styles are all beautiful in their own way and i think that that's kind of ties into the wabi sabi idea of we can find beauty in the way everyone's doing yeah, this. just accepting accepting it for what it is totally and you can't you can't really mimic someone else's style. Like everyone's got their own individual style, which, yeah, which is good. It's, yeah, it's admirable. And a good coach will nurture that. For sure. You know, I'm learning that in Muay Thai. There's basic, there's, there are conventional styles, um, but then somebody will see something in the way that you're throwing a kick mm. and like, oh, that's, no, that, that's how you, that's, that's what I want, I want to see you do that. That's you, you know. Yeah. Don't don't bother doing the others. Do that. Yeah. It's yeah. like kind of like you know, don't push Mongo. Yes. Kind of like just like these weird nuances of like rules that come into it, where you're like, oh, maybe avoid pre grabs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was guilty of that. I pre grabbed all the time, but I still do. But yeah. I mean, there's stages in learning. But then, like, I think, um, you know, particularly once you spend time with a good coach who's focused on you they do start to develop that element of, for sure of what it is that makes your style specific and special yeah you can yeah correct those mistakes earlier mm. so then later on you've sort of mastered it a lot a little bit more and i think like with everything you kind of gotta you can't attain somebody else's style but you kind of do mimic elements of people you admire yeah until you have the basics to to create your own yeah for sure yeah. Um, mm. So we've been rambling on for a little bit now, but <laughs> before we finish it up, it's been a pleasure. I think uh, you, you, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything, right? And and you're a guy who embodies that, uh, your presence that you bring to the skate park, to a meditation session, to the surf, or just to bumping into people on the street is very consistent. And I think a lot of people in our community recognize that in you thank you yeah that's very kind and generous of you to say (laughs) that but yeah i also admire you as a person too like very kind caring compassionate and yeah that's sort of a reflection of yourself as well so thank you yeah thanks for having me on the potty it's been a pleasure but before we wrap it up if there are kids or parents who are keen to have a lesson with you yeah you're starting a new venture as well as Sabi skateboards, so they can buy a Sabi skateboard <laughs> and potentially grab a lesson with with you. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm in the works of uh, sort of a skate coaching program, you could call it. 
um, where we'll just be offering group lessons, private lessons, um, yeah, within the Geelong surf coast, potentially Melbourne region as well. Um, yeah, so that's going to be called Ollie North Skate Coaching. Ollie North yep. Skate Coaching. Yeah, that's us. <laughs> nice. And there'll be a website. Yeah, there'll be a website and yeah, hopefully we'll um we'll get rolling soon. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Simo. It's been a pleasure to have a chat. <laughs> thanks, Mark. Um, well, you enjoy the rest of your day and thanks everyone for listening in. Thank you. That's Simon Dunn. <laughs>